come read some stuff with me. It's a good time guaranteed, starring talented vocal performers. I can't promise it's PG, so kids don't listen, please. Come on down to Dale's Reading Corner. Icky. I tested is... it for like five hours yesterday and it was why? working and now it's not and <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm well, gonna stop, I'll stop. I'll stop momming at you then. Oh, uh, no, I did everything right and it still isn't working. Uh, how's things going, Dale? Well, my backup recording thing is now also not working but screw it i leave it up to the whims of the audacity <laughs> and the discord gods the whims of acid for a second huh i thought you were gonna say the whims of acid for a second it's like uh. I'm just gonna drop a couple tabs and see what happens but <laughs> probably not no no this is a sober reading this is a, oh, that's right. This is a sober reading. I'm sorry. Because I, it's not New Year's Day, and I didn't have a drink. That's that's your misfortune. But okay. No, I don't <laughs> drink very often. New Year's is a special. No way. I'm I'm live. I am live. All right. <laughs> I need to. Let's start. Let's start this I'm thing. New. Yes. This is about as functional as a reading corner should be. Hello, everybody, and welcome to. Reading Corner. I've been doing battle with my computer for about six hours now. Everything was working, now it's not. If you're listening to this, it means it worked well enough for me to record the episode. Today, I'm joined again by the wonderful Dave Tastic. That is me, Dave Tastic Dave, the man on the internet that does the funny bone man voices. Last time it was you do the funny skeleton voices online. Pretty much. Okay, well, I asked people for uh, questions, as I think you read um, in general. I asked people questions for Dave, and I have two. One makes sense. It's uh, what got you into Undertale in the first place. Oh, well, sometimes it's just channels. For me, it was um, a YouTube channel by the name of Game Grumps. A very, very oh! underrated channel. Oh, Game Grumps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little up-and-coming they... channel. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember back, way back when, in the early years, there was a show called Steam Train that was on the same channel. Uh, and Ross and Barry played Undertale. And then they were like, hey, this game is actually good. You guys should go play it. I've uh, watched that. Yourselves. I've yeah. watched that. It's amazing. And then I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I, I got the game and I played it on my own. And then I watched the rest of the series. Nice. Well, one other question. He has the question for Dave. What do you think of Bob the Builder? <laughs> uh, I don't like the remake. They remodeled him and they ruined his entire figure. I miss oh, the no. old Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the new Bob? It's terrible. It, it's I'm uncanny. not sure if you're joking or not. It's I, disgusting. I were joking about a reboot. Can we fix it? Can we fix it, Bob? I hope we can. <laughs> the, the, the new design, I need it fixed, Bob. We need you back. <laughs> Alright, anybody in the live chat have any other questions before we start this? Ask me questions. What's my favorite color, you ask? Wine red. Thank you. Oh, interesting. interesting. That is why my profile pictures tend to have me in a wine red shirt. I was about to mention. Favorite color. Yeah, I was about to say that it it does match your shirt. Uh, fave food and fave pet. I think. Are those the same question? Food and pet. <laughs> no, <laughs> two um, different people. You're economical. Huh. Uh, favorite food. I like a good burger. I made it a point to go to different restaurants and try burgers and like rate them. Favorite That's character to voice tech, probably Papyrus, because it took years to go from my naturally deep voice, which uh, I can even tell just in my regular speaking voice, my voice has lightened up a bit since back then, uh, to to Papyrus, which is, I don't know, he's I think he lives more like at the top of where my throat is. That's where... Saying voices live somewhere is just where it comes from. Oh, yeah. You feel it. 
Yeah. Yeah, you said yeah. that last time. Uh, yeah, you said that last time, and you said something about Papyrus's voice in the back of your throat. He is. So, uh, let me see. He. Yeah, back of the throat. Very <laughs> top. Yep. Little nasal. Only a little nasal, but not as much as I've heard other people do it. I guess. Yeah, too nasal is. It's like okay, okay, that's that's stop. Please stop. That's Waluigi. Um. <laughs> Any other questions? How, deep, how uh, deep can you go? I say, for once, not being filthy. <laughs> yeah, improv oh, isn't here. <laughs> improv isn't here, so I feel safe. I feel safe with you, Dave. How deep can you go? Um, I feel probably... safe with you, Dave. How deep can you go? <laughs> it's <laughs> terrible. Probably my Sans voice or my okay. Asgore voice, which just is, it's similar to my Sans voice, but more refined and calm and soothing. Yep. I haven't practiced Asgore voices much. I, I don't voice him often. Um, I don't think anybody voices Sans him voices, often. Sans voices, yeah. Sans voices uh, differ depending on the content because I've voiced Sans like really goofy and I've voiced Sans really sad. And the voice changes a little bit. I'm assuming that I'm going to do Frisk. I'll be honest. I wouldn't be very good at it. <laughs> I know, but I'll be honest. The reason why... A large part of the reason why I wanted Improv to do Frisk in the last one isn't so much that I wanted to hear him try to do Frisk, which was a good reason, and it turned out amazing. <laughs> but it's also because uh -huh. I don't think I do a very good Frisk. I don't sound very feminine, naturally. Me. I will try my best this time. So Frisk doesn't have to sound feminine. Frisk, Frisk can sound like Dale. Dale, what's your favorite breed of dog? My favorite breed of dog? Uh, well, I have... It's it's my dogs. And my dogs are their very own special breeds. Maxi, uh, my PFP is Maxi. He's a cockapoochie, which... I only know because I did the genetic test, and then my other smaller dog who doesn't show up as much in videos and such is a mostly chihuahua and then other stuff. Kakapuchi is a funny word. Kakapuchi is uh, a great. <laughs> Kakapuchi. Actually, yes. that's that's kind of awesome. Everybody say it out loud right now. Kakapuchi. I Kakapuchi. should never have told you, Icky, because you're going to make it something dirty. Uh, I don't have to. It is. It's like pointing at a pile it's of dirt and being not. like, oh, it's filthy. It's for <laughs> Cocker Spaniel! Cockapoochie. Yes. It's when you forget to spray in the bathroom. Cockapoochie. <laughs> My god. Um. I should never have told you people. Oh. <laughs> people are ruin my nice, innocent, beautiful dog. No, it's fine. It's fine. You can it's just... Cockapoochie. I mean, it's fine. Hmm. Oh. God. Ugh. Anyway. All right. Well, shall we? shall we read today's fic? Oh, that's why we're here, right? Yes, uh, there was sure. there was an original plan. I believe I've gotten everything <laughs> out of the way. Oh, we should probably mention just real quick, uh, Bonely Hearts Club, because that's a yeah, thing. Plug. Yes. Plug, 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 plug. Oh! Bonely Hearts Club. It's great. Yes, I also need to plug. If you enjoy today's episode, please give Dave a tip. I will put a link in the description. You can buy me Kofi, or yeah. you can just send me PayPal money, even a dollar. Good. All yes. proceeds go to me eating food <laughs> and traveling. All proceeds from work. All proceeds to go to Dave's food. food. <laughs> All right. Well, today's fic is Good Intentions, Franz Edition. This is a fic by me. Um, I originally wrote it as a reader insert parody of the original Slave Tale by V-Mum. Uh, Slave Tale is one of the more f***ed up AUs, so today's fic is PG-13, but it is pretty much the only PG-13 Slave Tale fic, so if you go looking at Slave Tale after this, just caution. Caution about that. Slave Tale and uh, Biddy Bones are my two favorites. But uh, the setup of the original Slave Tale is uh, monsters come topside, humans go all black mirror and just enslave them immediately with 
uh, control callers. Control callers uh, do what they say, or, you know, what you think they do. They control a monster's actions, uh, and the monsters are pretty much enslaved. Mm -hmm. uh, this version is a parody of that because, one, it's Underfell, and the backstory is a little bit different, and I have a prologue that explains how the backstory is a little bit different. Prologue! Uh, take us away, Dave. I start prologue. Do it! Chapter 1. Prologue. Eight years ago, magical monsters emerged from their centuries-long imprisonment under Mount Ebon and immediately declared war on humankind. Using the souls of seven humans, presumed to be among the plethora of missing persons cases for which Abbott was infamous, the monsters broke a magical barrier apparently constructed by humans of old to prevent such an escape. Their king made preternaturally powerful by these souls, spearheaded by an assault that absolutely devastated the surrounding cities. The monsters slaughtered without conscience, uncaring if their victims were armed soldiers or children begging for mercy. Human weapons were powerless against their magic and accelerated healing abilities. In the height of desperation, human government made the incredibly controversial decision to nuke Mount Ebbet, an action of which the ramifications would never be determined. As the monster somehow redirected the warhead into space, unable to track its location, all humans of the world collectively held their breath until an enormous cloud of dust on the moon's surface marked the missile's impact on the celestial body a week later. So they blew up the moon? Not blew it up, they just part of- they just landed a mook on it. Uh, mook, damn it. Nuke on it. Forever crescent moon. Um, no, it's not- it's a big <laughs> thing! One nuke it's isn't going to blow up the moon. They pissed on the moon? Okay. <laughs> Vinalona uh, makes right. fun of me frequently for the moon nuking. But... <laughs> anyway. All right, let's see. Oh, while monsters celebrated this, their greatest victory, the moon nuking marked a turning point in the war. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Until then, the monster's assault had been limited only to North America, where Mount Abbott was located. However, worldwide outrage over the attack on the moon provoked international action. Scientists and technological experts worked together, their efforts culminating in the development of magical control collars. These devices, while having no effect on humans, could not only disable a monster's ability to fight, but also completely override their actions. Kind of reminds me of the um, uh, the original Zootopia concept, where they use control collars on on the. Uh, that was the original Zootopia or concept. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, horrifying. Yeah. You should definitely look into it. I that's like terrible. that. I wish that was a plot point. Um, in the original Zootopia plot, uh, Nick Wilde had a control collar, which oh. prevents um, the predators from attacking. Uh, it would, like, shock them or something like that. Oh, God. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's <clears throat> interesting, but also not something I would expect in a kid movie. Exactly. That's why I wish they would have went with it. Uh, <laughs> anyway. That's real. The fighting quickly... Yeah. The fighting quickly turned from monsters against humans to monsters against other monsters controlled by humans. Six months later, the Monster King was dead, and any free monster still alive was on the lam. With the immediate threat neutralized, the government was now faced with the difficult question of what to do with the thousands of monsters they'd captured during the war. It didn't take long for money-making entities to see the potential profit in using collar-controlled monsters as magical slaves, and they lobbied for the release of all monsters to the public market. Opposition was strong, but in the end it was impossible to defend a race who had so ruthlessly slaughtered civilians. The public saw enslavement as justice, if anything. It was more mercy than the murderers deserved. A faction of eliminationists lobbied for all monsters to be terminated, 
and warned that dependency on the control collars was dangerous, but they were a minority. Seven years after the end of the war, monster slaves were a ubiquitous presence in most major U.S. cities. That's the end of chapter one. The end of prologue. Chapter the two. The end of the prologue. All right. We can switch off uh, paragraphs now. You go. All right. Chapter two. Love at first bite. That sounds like a story about vampires, but it's not. Ah. That's the title of chapter two. I see, yeah. I see. <laughs> Frisk had just finished work and was starting the long walk back to her car when she heard shouting from the sidewalk up ahead. She pushed through a small crowd to find a crotchety old man screaming and swinging his cane at someone on the ground. As the form dodged, his hood fell back, revealing a control collar under what appeared to be a skull? Huh, she'd never seen a bony monster before. Among sundry incoherencies, she heard the old man, presumably the monster's owner, scream. Do you want to be the old man, Dave? Uh, how old is this old man? However, however old you imagine him to be. All right, uh, sure. <clears throat> Stay still, damn it! A light on the collar flashed green as the command was accepted. The monster froze, completely unable to move or avoid the next attack. At this point, Frisk leapt into action and heroically tackled the old man, knocking both of them onto the sidewalk pavement. He responded by biting her arm, hard. Apparently, he still had his natural teeth, or they made dentures ridiculously sharp, because it actually broke the skin in a few places. When she yelled at an interested bystander to call the police, it completely freaked out the bitey old man. Frisk wondered if he had a criminal record. It wouldn't surprise her. The old man begged the young woman not to press charges and shoved a stack of papers in her hands, announcing that he was giving her the skeleton monster. Before she could say anything, he was already shuffling down the block as fast as possible. Chris considered chasing him down. It wouldn't be hard, but the monster on the ground took priority. Oh my god, are you alright? Frisk asked, holding out her hand to help him stand up. The skeleton didn't answer or take her hand. He continued to stare at Frisk with blank, dark sockets, jaw set in a sharp-toothed grimace. She pushed aside how unnervingly creepy it was and sat down on her knees putting aside the stack of papers and holding up her hands placatingly. I'm not going to hurt you, I promise. Please, I just want to help. The skeleton didn't move, but for a moment, two glowing red lights like pupils appeared in the darkness of his eye sockets. They traveled down to stare at his collar, where a red light was blinking, signaling that the monster was fighting a command. Huh? Oh. Oh! Duh. The last thing the old man was saying... Oh, no, that's not... <laughs> Duh. The last thing the old man had said was stay still. All Frisk had to do was give a different order. She cleared her throat and said in the most authoritative manner she could, You are allowed to move. The light on the collar blinked purple, but the skeleton stayed frozen in place. He looked at her with glowing pupils, his expression much the same but maybe a little annoyed? What? What does purple mean? Frisk asked. The skeleton rolled his eye lights, but didn't answer. Though apparently he was trying to, since the light blinked red again. Uh, you are allowed to speak! The light flashed purple. What the- I said, you are allowed to speak! Stop following that guy's commands! The collar continued to blink purple, which was rapidly becoming Frisk's least favorite color. What was wrong? Was it set to another language or something? She pulled up a translation app on her phone. I don't know how to pronounce these, but I'm gonna just say that Frisk doesn't know how to pronounce these either, so this is gonna be That's accurate. True. <laughs> uh, Sprechen, Ablar, Movik, Shula, Paroli, Labhar, Parlar, Ixbe Atenle. 
Expecto Patronum. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not even a good one for the situation. I don't know. Funny words. <laughs> <clears throat> the only thing her tirade accomplished was to attract the attention of passerby, curious why someone was screaming at their monster in a bunch of different languages. She caught the eye of one person who graced her with a particularly, well, yes. Baleful. Hateful. Baleful? Yeah, like Baleful. hateful. Okay. I only think of hay bales. <laughs> <clears throat> she caught the eye of one person who graced her with a particularly baleful stare as they walked past. Likely a fellow monster sympathizer, angry to see a monster being abused by its owner. She groaned. Uh, I'm so sorry. I don't know how these stupid colors work. She said to the monster. He stared at her with an only slightly less malevolent expression. After a moment, he gestured with his pupil eyelights towards the stack of monster's slave registration papers still lying on the ground where the man had dropped them. Oh. Oh! She remembered then that some callers could only be set to only allow commands from the owner. Is that caller locked to only listen to your owner? Look up for yes, down for no. The skeleton looked up, then continued staring balefully at her, his collar blinking red as he continually fought against its control. That old man gave me a bunch of your papers, but he didn't transfer ownership, did he? It was a rhetorical question, but the skeleton looked up anyways. Frisk sighed. Damn it. Well, now what? The skeleton rolled his eyes. Sorry, that wasn't a yes-no question. She said. Uh, I, I didn't really want to register as your owner, but I guess that's the only way, huh? He paused for a moment, then looked up, right. The thought of owning someone made Frisk sick to her stomach, but what else could she do? There's a monster DMV about two miles that way, but my car is parked a few blocks away. Frisk pointed down the street. Can I leave you here and come back with the car? The skeleton frantically looked downwards. Right, right. That leaves you kind of vulnerable, huh? Frisk looked at the monster on the ground. He was a little shorter than her, and considering that he was literally a skeleton, he probably wasn't super heavy. Uh, well, I guess I'll have to carry you. She scooped up the papers and started bending down to pick him up, but stopped when she noticed his eyes were black again. Oh, sorry. Is it okay if I pick you up? I promise, I'm gonna get that stupid caller to release you as soon as I can. She wasn't sure he was going to respond, but after a moment his red eye lights reappeared and tentatively moved upward. Right. Okay, uh... As gently as she could, Frisk scooped up the skeleton and set him on her shoulder. The pressure was forcing a quiet grunt from him, which puzzled her, because, as far as she could tell, he didn't have lungs. To her surprise, his bones were warm to the touch, and slightly soft. They were also a lot thicker than an actual human skeleton. He was heavier than Frist had expected, but not so much that it was impossible to carry him. The fact that he was frozen in place, and not dead weight, made it a lot easier. Okay. Dale is muted. Frick! Sorry. Um, sure, keep <laughs> keep going, sure, this paragraph, because uh I didn't eat breakfast and I can feel my blood sugar dropping. I need to eat just a couple okay, bites okay. of very soggy grape nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright. The walk to her car was probably the strangest experience of Frisk's adult life. To say that she and her reluctant passenger attracted a little attention would be an understatement. Every single person on the damnably yes damnably <laughs> damnably 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 mm -hmm. weird damnably sounds like a country word <laughs> well you don't say it damnably every single person on the damnably busy sidewalk stared at them some were polite enough to quickly look away but most of them ogled unabashedly 
at the spectacle of someone lumbering down the street with a monster flung over their shoulder. A few people laughed outright, and one particularly rude asshole actually had the nerve to pose for a selfie. The threadbare hoodie, t-shirt, and shorts the skeleton monster was wearing did little to pad his bones, which dug painfully into Frisk's shoulder the longer she went. Absently, she noticed that he didn't have any shoes on. The bones of his feet were all scuffed up, and it looked painful. Oh, frick, I was muted! Sorry! <clears throat> yes, you were. <laughs> Damn it! I can't... Me uh, okay. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. This is probably very uncomfortable for you. She said to the skeleton. We're almost there. It's just, like, two more blocks. The two of them were only a few feet from Frisk's car, when, in an excruciatingly ironic development, they encountered the wrath of a rather dim-witted yet aggressively passionate monster sympathizer walking by. The woman, who looked to be in her forties and sported a very I demand to speak to the manager haircut, was outraged by the one way wanton <laughs> wanton wanton um excessive wanton. Wontons. Wonton, wonton sure, wonton. call it wonton. <laughs> she was outraged by the was wontons. By the wontons, they were not cooked correctly. <clears throat> was outraged by the wanton display of cruelty before her. Why don't you be the uh, the woman? <laughs> How does a Karen sound? I don't know. Do your best. <laughs> you put that monster down right now. <laughs> She screamed. <laughs> oh, my mic clipped. I should probably record it again. <laughs> I'll back up. You put that monster down right now! <laughs> she screamed. No, no, you don't understand. Frisk tried to say. He's stuck. Unhand him, or I swear, I'm calling the police. There are laws. I'm not hurting him! Liar! I can see scratches and cracks all over him. People like you make me sick. How dare you do that to a completely defenseless monster? That wasn't me! Frisk started to protest, but at this point the woman apparently decided that calling the police would take too long and it was time to take justice into her own hands. In an abominably misguided attempt to save the skeleton from his abuser, she kicked Frisk in the leg smacking her left shin and knocking her foot out from under her. As someone who struggled to balance on one foot while standing perfectly still and not carrying a skeleton monster, she had no hope of remaining standing. Frisk felt herself falling forward and was flooded with that terrible... car. <laughs> <laughs> Stop with the car noise. <laughs> Frisk felt herself falling forward and was flooded with that terrible icy sensation of knowing you're about to have a violent encounter with the ground. In an act of heroism and selflessness worthy of legend, she threw all the movement she could into making sure the side of her body not holding a skeleton would hit the pavement first. She tightened her grip on him with one arm and reached out with the other to embrace for impact. Apparently her upper arm strength was worse than she had thought, though to her credit, she had been carrying something heavy for 20 minutes, because the last thing Frisk remembered was a very close look at an interesting crack on the sidewalk, and then blackness. You're muted still. Oh, frick. God you damn it, I did it again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Time for a POV change, mofos. Sands was pretty sure the screaming woman ran away immediately after knocking the other human unconscious, but he had landed facing the opposite direction and couldn't turn his head to see. A minute ago, as he was being paraded down the street, completely paralyzed and hanging off the shoulder of yet another new owner, while other humans laughed and took pictures, Sands was certain his life couldn't possibly get any worse. The universe had apparently taken the sentiment as a challenge, because now he was lying on the ground halfway on top of an unconscious human, and with a toe bone that really fucking hurt from where it had slammed into the concrete. 
It was probably broken, but again, he couldn't turn his head to see. Pedestrian, <laughs> Pedestrian traffic, which had been inconveniently heavy for the entire journey, had now almost completely dried up. The nearest human headed their way was walking several large dogs, and Sans prayed to the stars that the human under him would wake up before they both got peed on. Equally bad, the human with the dogs might assume Sans was somehow responsible for the incapacitation of his owner. Stars he hoped she wasn't dead. Ordinarily, he'd be thrilled to see any human get dusted, but right now he needed her alive. The fact that Sans very clearly couldn't move would do no good in court, where monsters rarely received even the meager rights to fair trial supposedly bestowed to them by law. Sans concentrated, trying to feel the presence of the human soul. Ordinarily, he would be able to see it as clearly as a star in the night sky, but the fucking control collar was set to suppress almost all of his magic. To his relief, he found the human soul after a few moments of searching. Huh. You didn't see red determination souls very often. She was still alive, but hurt. Probably concussed, if he remembered anything about animal brains correctly. Fortunately for this owner, Sans' previous one had kept a small channel of his magic unlocked specifically for healing, which he had forced the monster to use on his disgusting bunions. Sans was less than proficient in healing magic, especially when being chronically underfed and healing from his own injuries, but the stupid man never gave him a chance to explain that. Not that it would have mattered. At least the involuntary use of what little healing ability he had had meant that the monster was now more practiced than ever before. Me? No, no, no I'll keep doing because you can do you can oh. do Sans internal dialogue coming up soon. Ah. Yeah. Some internal dialogue. Um. Nice. Yeah. Trying to ignore the pain in his foot and disconcerting awkwardness of his frozen position, Sans focused on his own soul and generated a strand of green healing magic which he stretched in the direction of the human's head. It took a few tries before he made the connection, but eventually he was able to find the area that had sustained the most injury. Ah, oh, this is... this is... Uh, Underfell Sands! <laughs> Underfell Sands. Underfell Sands! Did you say he was uh, a little taller? Or a little shorter? He's he's a little shorter than first, because I mean, he's like regular... A okay. little, little bigger than Sands in the game, but... Sands in the game is gotcha. shrimpy. <clears throat> Boss could do this so much better, he thought as he worked. The subsequent pain of sadness broke his connection, and Sans mentally cursed as he searched again for the connection. Frick, I messed Don't that up, think sorry. About him now. Well, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I messed that up, sorry, I messed up my own fic. The subsequent pang of sadness broke his concentration, and Sans mentally cursed as he searched again for the connection. Don't think about him now. Focus. This idiot clearly has no experience with monsters. You finally have a shot at escape at finding- Oh shit, neighbors are making noise. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you stay in character, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> you finally have a shot at escape in finding Pap. But first you need to- No. <laughs> But first, you need this oddly attractive, dumb human to unfreeze the fucking collar. Wait a minute. What the hell was that last part? Sans imagined shaking his head to clear it and focused on healing. After a minute of effort, the completely hideous and not attractive human under him finally started to stir. She groaned and slowly raised a hand to her head. Ow! She mumbled, shakingly pushing herself off the ground. At this point, she must have noticed the weight of the skeleton monster laying halfway on top of her, because she turned her head around to look at Sans. Upon seeing him, her... What? <laughs> how am I reading this? <laughs> I don't know how you want to read that! <laughs> Alright. Upon seeing him, her beautiful, I mean, dull, amber eyes lost their lethargic gaze and took an expression of panic. Oh my god, are you okay? She said, carefully lifting Sans' rigid body as she worked her way into a sitting position. Uh, Sans answered, Yes. <laughs> with his eyes. Or, yes? <laughs> with his eyes? Yeah. Yes. 
That's narration, right? Yes, it is narration. But I li okay. I like the Sans voice for it. I'll, I'll read it in the other way, just in case. <laughs> <clears throat> Sans answered yes with his eyes, relieved that the caller did not seem to recognize this as a lie, despite the fact that one of his toes was almost certainly broken. Oh, thank God. What was that lady's problem? I'm trying to help you. Seriously. There's a group I heard about who might hurt... Ah, uh, frick. There's a group I heard about who might help us. I heard they rescue monster... The human suddenly cut herself off, clapping a hand over her mouth. Wow. She had really pretty lips. No, bad skelly. They were very, very ugly and completely unkissable. Gross. Human lips. What was wrong with him? <laughs> I love your delivery of that. That was great. <laughs> Good. She looked up and down the street, as though checking if anyone had been listening. At this point, the guy walking his dogs had reached them, but even if he had been paying attention, there was no way he could have heard anything over the music thumping loudly in his headphones. As it was, he didn't do so much as spare a glance for the injured human and the frozen monster lying on the sidewalk. Typical fucking human. Hang on, I'll make room in the car. <laughs> oh, this is funny," said the ugly, repulsive human woman. <laughs> she carefully laid Sands on the ground before struggling to her feet and gathering up the scattered mess of registration papers. A minute later, she had the back door of the car open and returned to pick him up. Either she was not completely healed from the concussion, or just naturally very clumsy because as she pushed Sans into the car feet first, the beleaguered skeleton could only watch in helpless terror as the edge of the door frame rapidly approached his face. Oh my god, I'm so sorry! Add sound effect there. That would be funny. <laughs> yeah. Add sound effects to reading. It's bonk. great. <clears throat> yes. Do the cartoony bonk. Why? Yeah. <laughs> uh... Sans silently vowed that before he escaped, he would make time to kill this human. Yeah. <laughs> End of chapter two. I'm glad you like the ugly repulsive woman. <laughs> it's <Sorry>. funny. <laughs> Thank you. This is, I think, the only slave tale fic that's meant to be kind of funny. Okay, next chapter. Uh, chapter three, the monster DMV interesting yeah i it's one of those it's one of those things that it's not actually called that but that's what everybody calls it you know because like in real life people come up with nicknames for things that aren't real so it's like the monster registration office yes. sort of thing yes it's okay. like for <clears throat> non-american listeners the dmv stands for department of motor vehicles and it's where you go to register your car and get uh, your driving license tests and a bunch of other stuff and it's a pain to go to because there's always like long lines and everybody has to go there sometimes you know to do stuff but it's always a pain to go there but so the place where you yeah. register monsters and take care of that everybody calls it the monster dmv in this world okay got it all right <clears throat> Fitting the skeleton into the back seat of her economy hatchback was harder than Frisk had anticipated. It wasn't that the monster was large, he was actually pretty small. But the way he was frozen in place made it awkward. Apparently the caller had taken the command to hold still extremely literally. The monster couldn't even bend his arms and legs. The back seat of her car wasn't quite wide enough for his rigid form to fit lengthwise. And it wasn't as if she could just prop him up sideways. That seemed like it would be super uncomfortable. Eventually, Frisk managed to fold down the back seats and... Oh, trash. Gross. <clears throat> Eventually, Frisk managed... <laughs> we learn, like we learn uh, later, we learn later that it's because a friend of hers borrowed her car for the week and completely mm, just filled it up with garbage. Okay. I really don't like when cars don't have trash in them because it's it's gross. It's really disgusting. <laughs> to me. You wouldn't like um, this car. <laughs> no. 
<clears throat> Dave, Eventually Dave, will you be matter. able to read sure, it? Sure, sure. Will you be able to read it, Dave? Uh, I'll try. Because it gets worse. <laughs> no. <laughs> Eventually, Frisk met Frisk. 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 I'm the Swedish chef now. Frisk it Frisk it Eventually, Frisk managed to fold down the back seats and push enough trash out of the way to make a flat surface big enough for the skeleton to sit in the same pose he'd been in. This is a long sentence. <laughs> You're a long sentence. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, eventually, Frisk managed to fold down the back seats and push enough trash out of the way to make a flat surface big enough for the skeleton to sit in the same pose he had been in when the old guy yelled the command. Good she couldn't job. exactly... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she couldn't exactly buckle him in, so she'd just have to be extra careful while driving and not get a ticket, because traffic violations are expensive. Yeah. Frisk was so careful, in fact, that she paid much more attention to the road than what she was saying, treating her literal captive audience to an unfiltered stream of verbalized thoughts get ready for a couple of paragraphs of me just talking <laughs> oh thank goodness okay <laughs> yeah dave feel free to go feel free to go get a snack or something because this is gonna take this is gonna take me a while <laughs> to uh, get through these um <clears throat> okay Right now, we're going to the government monster department office thing, or whatever it's called, to get you unlocked. I mean, the collar. Can't unlock you. That'd be silly. <laughs> After all, that would take a skeleton key, wouldn't it? But um, shh. Sorry, was that joke offensive? It was, wasn't it? Sorry. In all seriousness, I want to make it clear that I do not believe in monster enslavement. I mean, I believe it exists, you know, obviously, haha. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, I don't believe believe it, you know? Uh, I'm gonna groan for real, because I can hear my dogs barking. Shut Bark. up! <laughs> Hold on one moment, I have to close the door. Alright. Hope you're all doing well. Guys. I'm having trouble with my brain and my face reading. Will Dell remember to unmute? These are question. Place your bets. Uh. <laughs> ah, sorry, I'm back. Sorry, my dog was barking. I had to close oh, the door. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh. There are dystopian novels about this kind of thing. I know humans are flawed, but we regressed two whole centuries backwards in less than a year. People don't understand that history repeats itself every time. They're like, oh, this time it's different. But it's really not. It's not different just because this time it's happening to you and you can justify it because you're intimately aware of the issues instead of looking back in a history textbook of a bunch of people you can't even remember the names of. Everybody thinks they're special and what happened to other people won't happen to them. But that's what the people in history books thought too. And it's what people are going to think when they look back on what's happening now. <laughs> hey, maybe this will make you feel better. I don't know how much you know about human history, but humans have been enslaving each other pretty much all the time we've been alive. It's not something personal against monsters. We're terrible to other humans, too. Yeah, there have been some nice matriarchal civilizations that didn't have slaves, and everyone got along and they all eight nuts and fruits or something. But they were pretty much wiped out every time by these violent patriarchal societies that would just come in and be like, let's make this place more terrible and get rid of all the happy peacefulness. God, screw the patriarchy. I don't know how it was with you guys in the underground, but up here, women weren't even allowed to vote in America until like 1918 or something. Wow, I should really know that. That's the public school system for you. All I remember is that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, and I'll take that knowledge to my grave. Good. Because <laughs> it is. It is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> uh, dotted lines. What do dotted lines mean? That I means a change. Small. That means we're doing another POV change. 
mofos. P- <laughs> what's the POV now? The POV is <laughs> the POV is the car. <laughs> the car room room. Yeah. Uh, I was talking for a while, so why don't you take over this part? Yes, yes. If a genie had appeared and given Sans a wish to kill one human he wanted, wherever they were, he would have chosen this one. Never mind that this particular human was currently piloting the car that he was in. He'd risk dying in a crash ten times over just to make this human shut the fuck up. She... <laughs> That's mean. <laughs> he's afraid he's under fell Sans, what do you expect? Okay. She could at least have turned the radio on. Even the worst music in the world would have been better than this one. Oh, no. God, yes. This is a hard sentence. Sorry. Even the worst... <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy with the sentence, but it's... Even the worst... I'll try. Even the worst music in the world would have been better than this one-sided barrage of military-grade drivel. It was bad enough being frozen in place, sliding round in a small sea of empty soda cans and cell phone wrappers. <laughs> cell well, phone wrappers? Not cell phone wrappers. What does that cell even mean? Uh, cellophane. <clears throat> it was bad enough being frozen in place, sliding round in a small sea of empty soda cans and cellophane wrappers. It was infinitely worse being forced to listen to a human yap about how it was apparently okay for humans to enslave monsters because they enslaved other humans too. So at least the injustice was fair. Wow, that was a hell of an oxymoron, wasn't it? Fair injustice. Poetic and stupid. It didn't matter what the human said about... <laughs> yeah. It didn't matter. No, it didn't. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter, matter what the human... In the end, it doesn't, <gasps> it doesn't even doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> it didn't matter what the human said about how they just wanted to help and won't ever use the collar, I promise. Sans has heard it enough times to not believe it again. That had been one of the dumbest mistakes in his life, and one he didn't plan on repeating. What was that human expression? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, and now I've been double fooled? <laughs> or something like that. He never felt like the phrase was worth devoting to memory. Over the past eight years, Sans had come to realize that the only thing about a human that really mattered to a monster was whether they were smart or stupid. This human was definitely the latter. Their unchecked rant about the plight of monster kind only further exemplified how seriously out of their depth they were. This human was a scared little kid floating in the deep end of a swimming pool, and they were the best shot he'd had at escape in years. He just had to wait for the right moment. Sans' machinations were interrupted by the shrill squeak of rubber on metal as the car suddenly braked. The vehicle screeched to a dead stop in a matter of seconds, subsequently creating a force of inertia that sent the monster careening into the back of the seats in front of him. The worst part was that he landed directly on his broken toe again. If Sans could talk, he would have had some choice words for the driver. As it was, all he could do was redouble his efforts to think of a way to escape that involved collateral damage in the form of a specific, annoying, yet strangely attractive human- No. No, annoying wasn't nearly a strong enough word. Frick, no. Annoying wasn't nearly a strong enough adjective for what he'd been through today. Exasperated? Aggravated? Pissed off? Through the waning days of blunt force trauma, he heard the human shout, My bad! I thought that street was one way! They really should put up better signs, but never mind. Are you okay? Oh, right, you can't answer me. Well, we're almost there, so you should be able to move again soon. Just hang tight, okay? Alright. POV change! It's back to Frisk in the... We've arrived at the Monster DMV. So, we are here. We are here. So, Dave, start it off. You can be the creepy man. Uh, it's creepy. Yes, yeah, sort of. Creepy man asking first if he wants help carrying <laughs> Sans. Okay. He, he only has a couple of sentences of dialogue. Got it. He's creepy. You want some help with that? <laughs> Perfect. 
a man asked Frisk as he carried the skeleton- Frick! A man asked Frisk as she carried the skeleton into the government building. The offer was tempting, but the man gave off a bad vibe. Like he was going to take the monster and run. Frisk had heard of that kind of thing happening. She specifically remembered it because she had been angry that the news was referring to monster kidnapping as theft. Uh, no, thank you. I got it. The man looked a little disappointed, which only furthered her suspicions. Uh, you sure? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I just gotta make it up to the third floor, right? That's what it says on the directory. You sure? That's pretty far. Well, there's an elevator, right? The man pointed to the left. Yeah, but it's all the way on the other side of the building. Ah, crap. Well, thanks for the directions! Frisk said cheerfully, and headed off towards where the man had been point- Ah, uh, Frick. And headed off towards where the man had pointed before he could say anything else. Dogs are barking again. Or ah, god damn it. Whatever. I think it's too- They're too far away for it to pick up. Much. That's fine. Whatever! The skeleton wasn't super heavy, but she'd already carried him all the way back to her car, and then she had to park on the far end of the building's parking lot. Her arms were getting dangerously tired. Not only that, but the spot where the old man had bitten her was really starting to hurt now that the adrenaline of their legendary fight had worn off. Looking closely at the wound for the first time, she realized it was more serious than she had originally thought. The old man had apparently unhinged his jaw like a snake because there were spots where the skin was broken on the top and underside of her forearm. She should probably get a tetanus booster. Wow, she hoped this wasn't how the zombie- Frick! Wow, she hoped this wasn't how the zombie apocalypse got started. Frisk soon noticed that she and her unwilling piggyback buddy were getting... Bleh, yeah. Yep, unwilling Frisk. piggyback buddy. <laughs> That's him. Yeah. <laughs> Frisk soon noticed that she and her unwilling piggyback buddy were getting more than a few stares from human and monster kind alike as they semi-successfully navigated the bureaucratic labyrinth. A few of them snickered, and one monster bumped the monster next to her with her elbow and pointed. Do they know you? Frisk whispered to the skeleton, briefly forgetting the entire reason that they were there because he couldn't speak or move. That didn't stop her from digging the hole a little deeper, though. Wait, is that racist to be like all monsters know each other? Oops, sorry. As they got further into the building, however, her thoughtlessness comment turned out to be correct. Thoughtlessness a comment? Dog <laughs> Did I say that wrong? Thoughtlessness? It should be. Okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> As they got further into the building, however, her thoughtless comment turned out to be correct. A dog-shaped monster laughed. Ha, uh, no. <laughs> a dog-shaped monster laughed. Ha, uh, why am I saying that H noise? <laughs> because it's laugh, that's why. Mm. A dog-shaped monster laughed loudly and literally barked. Why don't you do this? Because uh, there are a lot of voices you can do. <laughs> There's a lot of voices, I think. <laughs> well, yeah. There's very little dialogue other than Frisk, so you should do all the dialogue besides Frisk. Hey, Sans, How's it hanging? <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> that was the skeleton's name? He wasn't saying anything, of course, but she started to feel warmer in her arms. Frisk saw in a passing mirror that his cheekbones had gone a rosy flush. She wasn't sure whether that meant he was embarrassed or angry. Probably both. Even without being able to talk, she got the distinct impression that he wanted to kill everyone in here and then her. Possibly not in that order. They continued to receive derisive attention all the way until they reached the Department of Monster Whatever. To Frisk's infinite relief, there was no line. She walked right up to the front desk, where a woman was trying unsuccessfully to staple a thick stack of paper. When she saw Frisk standing behind the counter, she paused in her endeavor, long enough to say, Do you want to take this woman behind the counter, Dave? <laughs> uh, 
Or should I? I can do it. I can do it too. Chucky over there will help you. Then resumed battling the office supplies. Before Frisk could ask where exactly Chucky was, a very tall, excited young man ran over to her. All right, you get to do Chucky. Uh, what is this? Get inside his head, his moral quandary. Well, he's tall, he's excited? He's a tall, young beanpole kid. Whatever voice you think that should be. Huh. Uh, let's see. OMG, that's a skeleton monster, right? They're super rare. I don't have enough energy to be this guy. <clears throat> he said, as if the monster on her shoulder was a high-value trading card. She waved for Frisk... No. He waved for Frisk to follow him. I don't even remember the voice. <laughs> Come on, we can get you registered or whatever over here. She followed the chipper youth to a room filled with green curtained stalls, each containing a couple of regular chairs, a rolling stool, and a desk with a computer, and some other equipment Frisk didn't recognize. It distinctly reminded her of a phlebotomy lab, the place where you go to have blood samples taken for testing. Chucky gestured for her to have a seat. Uh... She stammered, unsure of what to do with the monster she was carrying. After a moment, Chucky noticed her hesitation. Oh, you can put your monster down. It's fine. It was the first time Frisk had heard someone call the skeleton your monster. It sent a sickening chill down her spine, and she gave an involuntary shudder. No. She said resolutely. I'm not putting him on the ground. The youth looked down and considered the laminated tile floor for a moment. Yeah, I don't blame you. Who knows what kind of crap has been spilled in here? He snapped his fingers as the idea came to him. Hold on, I'll be right back. He ran to the front room, almost colliding with a woman leading a large bear monster on a chain. Watch it! She snapped. Sorry, ma'am, Chucky said. What can I do for you? The woman pointed at the bear monster. I think the collar is malfunctioning. He's not listening to what I say, and it keeps getting worse. Okay, well, I'll be with you in a few minutes, Chucky said, and waved towards one of the stalls. Please, have a seat. He ran out of the room, then reappeared less than 20 seconds later, pushing a squeaky wheeled gurney. There, he said, stopping next to Frisk. You can put him on this. Okay, this next sentence is long... And complicated. <laughs> Take it away, Dale. Alrighty. <laughs> okay. The gurney looked like it had been bought at the liquidation sale of a particularly thrifty hospital that had been put out of business by a series of lawsuits following the lethal failure of cheap equipment. That is to say, the gurney looked rickety. But the linen sheet covering it seemed clean enough, so Frisk gently lowered the frozen monster onto it, making sure to put him down right side up. Chucky plopped down on the rolling stool by the desk and logged into the computer. You got paperwork? Frisk reached into her back pocket and took out the tightly rolled stack of papers the bitey, hopefully not zombie old man had thrown at her. She handed them to Chucky. He smoothed them out as best he could, then flipped through a few pages before finding the one he needed. Here we go. Monster ID form. He typed in a long string of numbers and letters, having to repeatedly look back and forth between the paper and the computer. The new callers have QR codes, he remarked offhandedly. But that one looks like an old model, maybe even first gen? Frisk looked at the skeleton monster, noting that the eyes in his lights had gone out again. Hey, she said gently, resisting the urge to put her hand on his shoulder. You doing okay? His eyes stayed dark, so she figured he was probably not going to respond. Not that she blamed him. This whole thing must suck so bad. But a few seconds later, the red dots in his eye sockets reappeared. He stared at Frisk with keen intensity, then looked up. Pfft, she scoffed good-naturedly. Yeah, you know what? I don't believe you. But don't worry, we should have you unfrozen soon. Holy crap! Chucky shouted. Do you know who this monster is? Frisk frowned. What? 
No, I just met him. Why? What's wrong? That's Sans Undertow. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, Chucky pointed... Uh, frick, now I'm too excited. Chucky pointed to the computer screen. That's Sans. Apparently he was one of the most dangerous monsters in the war. He killed a lot of humans. What? Really? Frisk felt the blood in her veins turn to ice. She knew he'd probably fought in the war, but... But he's so small! Frisk could almost physically feel the heat of crimson eyelights burning into the back of her head. She turned around to see the skeleton giving her a positively murderous glare. Oops. Says here he's got a bunch of magical abilities like big ass... What? He cuts himself off. Like he, big ass? No, he cuts himself off. He's like, he's he's oh, not. Like he's at work. He's not supposed to be swearing. Or others. Ah, uh, okay. It says here he's got a bunch of magical abilities, like big ass. Sorry, large laser beams and doing blue magic to grab people's souls. Chucky said enthusiastically, as though he were reading the stats of a powerful Yu-Gi-Oh monster. Dude, he's like. Mega dangerous. Says here he's even suspected in the death of one owner. And they think he's been used by big crime bosses or whatever to kill more people. Where did she even get him? Uh, this was a lot to process. Some old dude bit me and gave him to me so I wouldn't sue him, Frisk said. Chucky full-on guffawed and swiveled on the stool to face her. Bro, that's fu- freaking hilarious! Suddenly, his expression became more subdued. But seriously, that monster is not a fluffy little pet. You should sell him to the police or the military. They're always buying powerful monsters and you'll get a lot of money. Frisk didn't know what to say. Uh... Uh, Dave, take over this part because it's a lot of Sans sort of internal <clears throat> monologue, kind of. It's Sans- Mono We're switching Sans. again! It's Sans POV! Sans POV switch. And there it was, Sans thought. Another do-gooder human that was all for monster rights until they were reminded of the war. You know, that little crucial detail of how less than ten years ago, he and the other monsters had popped up on the surface world and started slaughtering humans. Sans had been through this a few times before. A human who tried to save them by buying him from someone worse, or in this case, accepting him as a weird bribe. But then they learned what he'd done and couldn't get rid of him fast enough. He would never admit how much that hurt. He didn't know why it did, but it hurt every time. And he was sold to the next buyer, hating humans even more. It was infuriating. The damn sentiment was blatantly hypocritical. After all, he had killed humans in the war, and still tried to whenever possible. Humans should be scared of him. And boy, did this human look scared. Good. That was good. He hated her. He wanted her to be scared. After the anti-slavery speech in the car, he was pretty sure that his new owner didn't have any direct connections to people who bought monsters. So it was probably going to be back to the old public auction house with old Sansy. He wondered if they'd keep him frozen until then. It was the smart thing to do. She'd want to sell him as soon as she could. Thanks, but no. He's not for sale. Sans blinked in surprise at the human. Was this really happening? You sure? The tall human asked. Cause I wouldn't, if I were you. Shut up, kid, shut up! Sans shouted in his head. But if Dummy over here actually wanted to keep him, they'd have to reset the collar and recognize a new owner. Which is exactly what he'd been hoping for. When the control collars were first deployed, they had a small problem where immediately after the owner transfer, they briefly lost power. This gave the monster a few precious seconds of free will. Later models had fixed this problem, but to his infinite shame and regret, Sans had been one of the first monsters captured, and his collar had never been replaced. 
In previous transfers, his owners had known about the flaw and took precautions in the form of chaining him down to a chair and pointing a gun to his face while they smeared their gross blood on his collar sensor. What? The collars, uh, they're, they're, they recognize owners by blood. Oh. That's taken from someone else's fic. <laughs> Okay. The idea for that. This but yeah, you have to put your blood in it to be recognized blood as a new order. Yeah. That's gross. Oh, well, it's an ID. Okay. <laughs> this beanpole kid who treated monsters with the go get em attitude of a Pokemon trainer didn't look like he'd be trained on how to deal with first gen collars. Yes, I'm sure. The human said firmly. What do I need to do to get control of his collar and let him move? The kid shrugged. All right, it's your funeral, he mumbled. He handed her a pen and pointed to the various parts of the paperwork. Sign here and here and put your information here. He picked up a box on the desk and shook out one of those one-use pointy needle thingies. To assign a new owner, you have to put a drop of your blood in that little hole in the collar. The human looked horrified. Wait, really? Uh, it's just how the magic works, don't ask me. The kid held out the needle. Those are called lancets, by the way, the single-use needles. I oh. completely forgot the name of them when I was okay. right, when I was writing this, hence one-use pointy needle thingies. Can you revise things after no. they've been submitted? No. Oh, one-use pointy needle... No, you absolutely can, but one-use pointy needle thingies is staying. Okay. You want to stick your finger, or should I? The human looked unsure. Uh, you better do it. Okay, the kid said. He reached into another box and pulled out a pair of night trail gloves. You gonna be one of those people who faint at the sight of blood? Sans always loved it when humans did that, but right now he was relieved to hear her say, No, no, I'm fine with needles and blood. I just, I don't know if I can do it to myself. Okay, just give me your hand. Oh, wait, I almost forgot. The kid sprung to his feet and picked up what looked like a barcode scanner from the desk. Gotta use this on the collar to unlock the transfer owner first. That's not how it's said. <laughs> Gotta use this on the collar to unlock owner transfer first. Otherwise, people could just transfer monsters wherever they want. Not wherever. Wherever. Otherwise, whenever. people could just transfer monsters whenever they wanted, you know? Sans stared maliciously at the boy as he held the device up to his collar, which gave a long beep signaling it was ready to accept a blood sample. The other human also got out of the chair and stood next to the gurney. The kid picked up the needle from where he'd left it on the desk and gestured for Sans' new owner to give him her hand. Sans struggled not to grin. This was the moment he'd been waiting for. The skeleton readied himself as much as he could without actually moving his body. Freedom, here we come! The needle was only a centimeter away when, in perfect dramatic timing, there was a thunderous roar followed by loud crashing sounds and a woman screaming. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Sans was faced towards the wall and couldn't see what was going on, but judging from the reactions of the two humans in front of him and the familiar voice of Freddy the Bear, he could pretty well guess. Freddy Fazbear? Yes. It, it may or may not be a reference. I, I totally meant to reference that when I wrote this. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, yeah, it was definitely on purpose. Okay. Reference. <laughs> Beanpole immediately put his long legs to use and sprinted away. To Sans' enormous surprise, the other human didn't. Instead, she frantically grabbed another needle from the box on the desk and pricked her finger then found the sensor on his collar and smeared blood on it. The collar gave a long beep, signaling that it had accepted the sample, and another short beep to confirm that it had started processing it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, she muttered. How long will it take until you can move again? The human stopped mid-word as she looked up in terror at something right behind Sans. All right, you get to do Freddy totally Freddy not Fazbear. Fazbear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, 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 if it isn't Sans the Skeleton. Rolled the deep voice of Freddy the Bear. What's the matter, buddy? You stuck? No bones or blue magic. The bear chuckled darkly. <laughs> well, 
I guess this is my lucky day. I almost feel bad, because no one else is here to see it. There are a lot of monsters who'd love to see you dust. He cracked his knuckles. Say goodnight, Sansy. Damn this first-gen caller. Yeah, it was the only one with the shutting off problem, but at least the new ones process blood faster. He had been so close to freedom, and now he was going to die at the paws of Freddy the Bear. Freddy the fucking bear! Sans figured his final thoughts should probably be something meaningful, so as he heard the whoosh of enormous claws, he pictured himself and his little brother together. Not as they had been in later years, but how they used to be, before things got bad. But the claws never hit him. Instead, he heard the human scream and felt her body slam into the back of the gurney, as, for the second time that day, she took a blow meant for him. Freddy growled. Out of my way, twerp! The human shouted between pained gaps. You... you leave him alone! The hell do you want to protect Sans for, dumb shit? Freddy asked. Apparently he wasn't interested in the reply, because a moment later there was another whoosh, and a heavy thud. <laughs> As the hum- <laughs> knock things oh. over on my desk. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and a heavy thud as the human went sailing across the room. Sans could just barely see where her body landed out of the corner of his eye socket. <laughs> my voice cracked. Sans could just barely see where her body landed out of the corner of his eye socket. She wasn't screaming anymore, which was probably a bad sign. Before Freddy could swipe at Sans again, the sound of more humans coming into the room got the bear's attention. Sans heard him run in that direction, roaring. The caller gave a short beep, meaning that it had reached the halfway point of processing the transfer of ownership. It wasn't done yet, but the previous owner's commands had been erased, and default commands were restored, which gave him permission to move again. With immense relief, Sans felt his body return to his control. He looked around at the scene. The room was in shambles. Several curtains had been knocked down, and paperwork was scattered everywhere. The lady who had come in with the bear monster lay motionless on the floor. The tall kid was nowhere to be seen. At the room's entrance, Freddy was battling four security guards, and seemed to be winning. It was utter chaos. Uh, why don't you do an underfell sans perfect? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Dave, do you want to start narrating, or...? Okay. The caller gave a long, loud beep as it finished processing the transfer of ownership. Then the light went out. The power was off. Without wasting a beat, Sans grabbed the collar and ripped it in half, sighing with relief as he felt the air hit his neck bones for the first time in years. This was it. He was free. The skeleton's magic was low after months of being suppressed, but after a few frustrating seconds, he managed to gather enough to teleport a short distance. He figured he'd aim for the roof of the building and stay there until his magic had recovered enough to teleport further away, which should only take a couple of minutes. Laughing maniacally, Sans hopped off the gurney onto the floor. He had to be standing when he teleported. He'd land tailbone first after trying it while sitting, and didn't feel like experiencing that pain again. He was just about to make the jump when a gasping sound caught his attention. A few feet away, the human, his human, was lying on the ground. She coughed pitifully, a condition which probably had something to do with the massive claw wounds across her chest and neck. <gasps> Whatever. Time to go. It's not like it mattered to Sans if this human died. He had spent the last hour and a half hoping for this exact thing, hadn't he? Besides, maybe she wouldn't die. Maybe another human would come in and save her. Sans looked back at the door, where five more security guards were struggling to subdue Freddy. The bear had already KO'd three of them, and didn't show any signs of stopping. Okay, so maybe another human wasn't going to be there in time. But that's fine. He just needed to forget about this dumb, compassionate human and leave while he still could. It was her own damn fault if she died because she'd made an idiotic decision to protect a killer like him. 
It wasn't like he'd asked her to save his life. Twice. Ah, shit. Now she was looking at him. Please! <coughs> the human gasped between gurgling breaths. <coughs> oh, no. <laughs> then she lay limp on the floor, unmoving. Fuck. No, I don't want to be that close to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Fuck! Fuck! Sans gave a loud, frustrating growl. What the hell is wrong with me? With no small amount of regret, Sans released the magic he had gathered to teleport and focused on healing magic instead. He knelt in the disgusting puddle of blood next to the human and put his hands over the wounds on her neck and chest. A bright green glow emanated from beneath his palms and his tissues began to slowly knit back together. It took him a whole minute to stop the bleeding. Several large blood vessels had been hit, and one was almost completely torn in half. As soon as Sans was reasonably certain that the human would live, he got back to his feet and started gathering magic for a teleport. Okay, time to get out of a deafening electric buzz shot through the skeleton's non-existent ears as an overpowering force usurped control over his body and magic. He seized up and fell face flirst <laughs> face flirst <laughs> Return <laughs> of the Swedish chef. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he seized <laughs> it's laughing too much. He seasoned it. <laughs> he he seized up and fell face first into the floor. His skull bounced sharply off the laminate tile as he landed, once again slamming his goddamn broken toe into the ground. As he lay there, groaning, he saw one of the guards holding a mass control beacon. It was a device made to take down an entire group of monsters at once. Sans was intimately familiar with the machines. After all, he had been one of the monsters they used to design it. For the second time that day, Sans found himself on the ground, completely unable to move. At least this time he could still talk, an ability he immediately put to use by screaming, Fucking again? Really? <laughs> hey! <laughs> Yay! And that's the end All right, of voila. this chapter. <laughs> Thank you, Dave, as always. A fantastic guest, a fantastic Underfell Sands, and eh. a fantastic uh, adolescent teen Chucky as well. He didn't talk, uh, Sands didn't talk much, rather. He, he couldn't. <laughs> he, so, yeah, he doesn't, chapter three, or sorry, chapter, the next two chapters, there are two more chapters after this that I've written, I still have more. The next two are very dialogue heavy. So those okay. ones have a lot of Underfell Sands and Frisk talking back and forth. Yeah. So those will be fun if you ever want to read more of this thing. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it another time. Yes, 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 absolutely. All right. Well, if you enjoyed today's episode, please give Dave a tip. He is a very good sport. So. Funny. And yeah, money. <laughs> money. Funny money. Funny money. Uh, and check out the free demo of Bonely Hearts Club. I will put a link to both of those in the description. Also check out my Tumblr. I do funny voice things there. I'm trying to post more often. Uh, and I might start posting some YouTube videos soon. Possibly. Alright, check out his Tumblr as well. I will also link that in the description. It's because I pissed on the moon! <laughs> I'm gonna aim higher. <laughs> I'm not gonna piss on the earth. 